song before? Some of you would have heard that before. The song you've just listened to is by Farrell Williams, released in 2015. It's called Freedom. Um, a couple of days before he released the track, uh, he premiered at a Glastonbury Music Festival before something like 100,000 people in the crowd. And he sang this song about freedom. Now, you see in the, in the film clip that he's singing and dancing in places and situations where we see an obstruction of freedom. And the underlying message of the song is that freedom can be pervasive. Freedom can actually take root in places where you don't see freedom. And he, uh, he uh, as I said, he, he debuted this song at Glastonbury. And uh, after Glastonbury, he was uh, interviewed after the performance. And he said this, he said, listen, uh, we all afterwards were kind of teary-eyed because the energy of the crowd was so big and it was so strong. He said, it was just like the wind. You can see the effects of it, but you couldn't see it. You just felt it because it blew through you and it blew past you. And I heard this, I actually read this this week, and it struck me. It struck me as interesting that Farrell Williams would choose to use an analogy of the wind to describe how freedom, how the thought, the human desire for freedom would just flow through a crowd and ignite a group of people. And we see that all the time, don't we? It's an interesting analogy to use. And in fact, the analogy that he used about the wind is actually a biblical analogy. For Jesus himself says in John 3, 8, he says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And these two, two contradictory or two competing pieces of information just fit them together in my mind. And I thought to myself, how appropriate, how appropriate to use the analogy of wind to describe the way that freedom takes root in a group of people when Jesus uses that same analogy to speak about how the Spirit of God ignites in our hearts. Isn't that appropriate? Isn't that appropriate that the Holy Spirit and freedom can be brought together so beautifully? Now, last week we began a study on freedom. It's called Born to be Wild, and we're looking at the book of Galatians. Now, last week, uh, if you remember, we learned a couple of things. We learned that uh, we all have an innate desire to be free, to return to this state of being free of our bondage, free of our obligations, free of rules, free of predetermined structures. We all want to break free of something, but we also found last week that we don't really know how to be free. Because on our own, we quite often will lay down our freedoms. And last week I said we lay down our freedoms usually for more palatable versions of bondage. And I gave a couple of examples of that. The first example I gave was of, uh, of a relationship. That when two people enter a relationship, they lay down their freedoms for each other, don't they? Individually, you have freedom, but you lay down your freedom to enter into a relationship with another person. Another example that I used last week was that of work. And that we might work uh, for an employer for 30, 40, 50 years. And we give up our freedom to work on our own for the promise or the hope of a future freedom, which is future financial independence or financial independence and freedom for our children or for other generations to come after that. You see, on our own, we have a tendency to lay down our freedoms. That's just what we do. We trade them in and we substitute them. And then we found, as we looked in Galatians chapter 1, we found this, that, Je that, Jesus, that Jesus is freedom. Jesus is freedom. We'll come to that one in a second. There you go. Jesus equals freedom. Now, I, I imagine that last week, when we started talking about Jesus equaling freedom, and in fact, we went further than that. We said Jesus plus nothing equals freedom. Jesus plus nothing equals freedom. And I imagine that for some of us in the room, we struggled a little bit with that concept. And I understand why. You see, in society, in our culture, it's not very politically correct to say that Jesus is the only way to freedom, is it? It's not very politically correct at all. And in fact, uh, if we listen to our culture, it'll tell us that the highest ideal that we can have in regards to religion is freedom of religion. What that really means is that you can have your Jesus and you can have your spirituality and you can have your other religion and that's okay. And in fact, all religions and all spiritual paths lead to the same goal. But what we found last week is that that's in odds with the words of Jesus who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And then he goes a step further and says, no one comes to the Father, God, except through me. He can't be any more black and white than that. But you see, culture struggles with this. Culture struggles with this. And they say, you can have your Jesus. Unfortunately, in the church, we kind of buy into this a little bit, I think. And when culture says to us, you can have your Jesus, we respond by saying, yes, I'll have my Jesus and I'll keep him to myself. Because you see, I don't want to step out into culture and say to you that you need my Jesus and that you need my Jesus because you've got your own beliefs and you've got your own religion. As long as I've got my Jesus, as long as I've got my own path, 
then we're all okay. And so what we do is we, we find this cultural um, pressure gets placed alongside our faith. And what we do is we take this cultural pressure, we take this religious freedom, we take this way of thinking, this worldview, we place it alongside Jesus, and we end up back where we were last week, that Jesus plus something equals freedom. Are you with me so far? Jesus plus other worldviews. Jesus plus an inability to offend somebody else's religious sensibility equals freedom. Now, when we look in the book of Galatians, we find that this is nothing new. Nothing new. We're going to have a look at uh, Galatians chapter 3, but before we do, I'm going to talk to you for a second about Galatians chapter 2, which we haven't read this morning. Galatians chapter 2 and Acts uh, Acts chapter 15 are very similar. Galatians chapter 2, we find that there's a problem in the Galatian church, and Paul addresses that problem specifically. And we find a bit more about it in Acts chapter 15. You see, Paul is talking to three groups of people in the church of Galatia. First of all, he's talking to Jewish Christians. These were people that were Jews, and they came to follow Christ. So they're from Jewish ethnicity, they're from the Jewish religion, and they come and they become followers of the way. Then there was a second group of people that were Gentile Christians. So Gentile means non-Jewish, so basically anybody else that would come and follow the way of Christ. And then there was a third group of people in this church, and they were called the Judaizers. The Judaizers. Now these people were not Jewish, and they had come to faith, But in coming to faith, they were trying to believe, or they were believing that they had to keep not only Jesus, but the whole Old Testament Jewish law. That they had to bring all of that alongside Jesus, and they were trying actually to permeate the church with a bit of pressure to saying that you had to be uh, holding on to the the Jewish observances, the Jewish traditions, and particularly the hot-button topic of the day was circumcision. And they were trying to convince Gentile believers to be circumcised as a mark of their following in after Jesus. So they sought to reinstate these rituals because they were saying that Jesus plus the Old Testament law equaled freedom. And the pressure they were putting on the early church to do this was pretty severe. So much so that in Acts chapter 15, we hear about something called the Jerusalem Council, which was really uh, Paul and Peter and James and a few of the other leaders from that time coming together to discuss this and say, is this really necessary for our new faith? Or is it just Jesus equals freedom? And uh, that's what they reconciled. In Acts 15. So in our passage today, in uh, Galatians chapter 3, Paul forcefully takes on this way of thinking. He takes on this way of thinking that Jesus plus the Old Testament law, the way that the Judaizers were trying to explain it, that that equals freedom. And he takes that on. He kind of deconstructs that and he shows, uh, he shows that that's not the way to view the law at all. Now remember that Paul was a Jew. In fact, he was a Jew among Jews. He was a pious Jew. And uh, he, says, he says in uh, Galatians 1, 4, 14, he says, I was advancing, about himself, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age. And I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Now we know from, if we're from church history that Paul actually would hunt down and kill Christians. That was part of what he did. And he did it out of religious fervor. This was a real Jew, a Jew among Jews. So he knew the Jewish laws more intimately than anybody else almost in that, that day. He knew the Jewish laws more intimately than these Judaizers. And what he's saying to the Galatians, and what we're going to get into this morning, is he's saying, you're not actually viewing the law in the way the law should be viewed. So he's trying to do two things. He's trying to show them the real purpose of the law, the law given to Moses. And he's trying to show them what the law looks like when you view it from the lens of Christ. When you look view it from the lens or the viewpoint of Jesus Christ. So we're going to start by reading chapter 3, verse 1. And come up on the screen. He says this, O foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message that you heard about Christ. What he's trying to do here is separate in their minds the work of Christ on the cross and the Old Testament law. He's trying to remind them that they're two separate things. Let's go on. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it wasn't in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Well, of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Christ. So once he's separated the law and the work of Christ in their minds, he then tries to link them. He then tries to link them and say that actually when you view the law through Christ, 
through the finished work of Jesus on the cross, then we see the Lord differently. And that's what he's trying to get them to do, trying to position them in these early verses to start to see the law in a new way, to start to see the law in a new way. And there's a lot in here. But what does this actually mean? So to actually do that, he needs to, uh, he needs to zoom out. He needs to take a wide-angle view. And in fact, he zooms all the way out so that in his perspective, you can see the work of Jesus on the cross and the law that was given to Moses, but he zoomed even further out, and he can see the promise that was given to Abraham. We're talking all the way back in Genesis. And we can see three events. And by zooming back and seeing all of these three events through a Jesus lens, he's able to explain to them what the law actually means. And in the next few verses, we won't go into them all here, but he weaves together a whole bunch of Old Testament tr- uh, scriptures to make his point. And he shows how different things link together. So, if he's drawing together these three events, the cross of Christ the law that was given to Moses, and the promise that was given to Abraham. What was that promise? You know, before the law was given, and in fact 430 years before the law was given, that's the stone tablets from Moses, there was the promise to Abraham. And God promised Abraham uh, a number of things, but you can really break down most of it into three categories. The first thing God promised to Abraham, this is well before the law, was a, a promise of posterity. He says, I will make your name great, make you a great people, a great nation. Promises him a people and a land. The second part of his promise, of his covenant promise with Abraham, uh, is basically that Abraham's faith would make him righteous before God, would justify him before God. And uh, we hear about that when Paul, a little later, says that Abraham believed God and God counted him righteous because of his faith. Then the third part of the promise was that this same promise would one day be available to all people. When God says to Abraham, all peoples will be blessed through you. And the promise that Abraham received that he would be justified because of faith, by grace through faith, is available to all people. And of course, the, the, the Galatians themselves are proof of this, aren't they? Because they weren't Jewish. They weren't part of the nation of Israel. And yet here they were receiving the good news, being justified before God by grace through faith. So God's promise to Abraham, Paul points out, predates the law by some 430 years. And therefore, because it predates the law, it's foundational to the law. It's foundational to the law. It wasn't cancelled when the law was given. He summarizes it in verses 17 and 18. They'll come up on the screen. It says, this is what I'm trying to say. I love it when he starts something that says, this is what I'm trying to say. It makes sense, doesn't it? The agreement God made with Abraham could not be cancelled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. For God would be breaking his promise, the promise to Abraham. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. Next slide. Why then was the law given? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? If the law wasn't given for the inheritance, if the law didn't have that power, then why was it given? And this is what Paul comes to. He says the law was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. Let me ask you a question. What's the worst kind of disease to have? What's the worst kind of disease to have? Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good point. Really good point. In a human condition, in the human world, let me suggest to you that the worst kind of disease to have is an undiagnosed disease. Yeah? The worst kind of disease to have is the one that you don't know that you have. You know, we hear about silent killers. The worst kind of disease is an undiagnosed disease. And here's Paul's point. If you have an undiagnosed disease, what do you do? You go to the doctor. And what does the doctor do? The doctor sends you on tests. And you might go to the x-ray machine, or you might go to the MRI machine. The MRI machine and the x-ray machine have the power to look at you and to see what's wrong. They have the power to look inside and find out what your disease is, what is wrong with you. And that's what he says the law does. The law is a diagnostic. The law is a diagnostic. It's like the x-ray machine. It tells us what is wrong with us. Think about it this way. When the law was first given to the Israelites, Moses comes down from the mountain with the stone tablets and the Ten Commandments. You can picture the scene, right? 
He's, he's under the weight of these things. And he gathers the people together and he says, I'm paraphrasing, of course. This is in my version of the Bible. He says, come together, guys. I've got some rules from God. And I'm sure they come skipping. I'm sure they're really happy about it. Go, yes, we've got some rules to obey. And then he starts to read them. First one, you'll have no other gods before me. Okay, they're sort of shuffling in their place. They're looking at their shoes. They're nudging each other and saying, yeah, don't tell Moses about that golden calf we just made. Yeah? Then he goes on and he says, you know, honor your father and mother. More of them look down at the ground. He says, you know, uh, do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false testimony. All of these things that he says, and I can imagine the scene. One by one, they're all doing this. Hmm. You see, the law is a diagnostic. It tells us where we are sick. What is our reaction when we hear that list as well? You know, we're told in Romans that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. The law has the power to tell me that I'm sick, but the law can't make that right with God. Just as the MRI machine and the X-ray machine can tell you that you're sick, but they don't have the power to cure you. They don't have the power to heal you. They have the power to tell you how to be healed, but they don't have the power to heal you. And it's the same with the law. It's a diagnostic. And while it tells us what the cure is, it has no power in itself to cure us. And Paul compares the promise of God to Abraham, which was a promise of life, with the law that was later given to Moses. Verse 21. He says this, Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Well, absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the Scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. So once again, we come back to Jesus. Once again, we come back to Jesus. You know, when we place our faith in Jesus, and when we place our faith in the equation that we heard before, that Jesus equals freedom, something miraculous happens. You know, in our faith, we believe that Jesus has done everything necessary for us to once again be right before God. That Jesus has paved the way for us to have forgiveness, paved the way for us to have right relationship with God. He has paved the way for us to escape the wrath and the punishment that was justly ours under the Old Testament law. And we find ourselves in right relationship with God. That's what we find when we place our faith in Jesus. When we say that Jesus plus nothing equals freedom. When we see that Jesus is the cure and that because of our faith in the cure, we're no longer seen as sick. That's what Jesus does for us. But the problem for us is that we so often try and add something else to the cure. Jesus plus something equals freedom. And this causes a problem because our text tells us that Jesus is on his own. That Jesus is on his own. And we need to get rid of the something. Now, if I remember my high school maths classes, and if you can send your mind back a little bit, we've got an equation up there. If we go back to the last one, Peter. Jesus plus something equals freedom. If you want to get rid of something, you have to subtract it from both sides. Do you remember that, high school algebra? have to subtract it from both sides. So if we want to get Jesus on his own as the cure, we end up with this next one. Jesus equals freedom minus something. And here's the whole problem. That whatever we are adding to Jesus for our faith and for our justification before God, whatever we are adding to Jesus is actually diminishing his value. It is diminishing the power of the freedom that we can experience. Whatever we add to Jesus diminishes our freedom. That's the problem. It diminishes his power within us. It diminishes his glory. And whatever it is ends up binding us. Because if you take freedom and you diminish it, what do you have? Bondage. So the very thing that we're adding to Jesus to get freedom ends up binding us. Ends up binding us, taking away from our true freedom. So the Judaizers wanted to add the Old Testament law to Jesus. They wanted to say that Jesus, believing in Jesus was not enough. You had to believe in Jesus and be circumcised and keep the Jewish rituals and observations, observances. And in doing so, they were creating something, creating a framework that was actually binding the new Christians. Because the very thing they were adding to Jesus to create freedom was actually creating rules that were binding the Christians. Paul tells them that they actually end up diminishing Jesus and that they themselves become bound by that same law. And by insisting that others would follow that same law, 
they were also binding the other believers and restricting their freedom. And so the application for us this morning is simple. It's this. It's to consider what are the things that we add to Jesus? What are the things we try to add to our faith in Jesus? And I think there's three applications for us this morning. I might get the team to come up. I think there's three applications for us this morning. First one is this. The Judaizers were trying to bring old traditions into their faith. They were trying to bring old Jewish customs into the new paradigm. And I think sometimes we're guilty of that. I think sometimes we're guilty of remembering days gone by and holding those things as fundamental to our faith. And we look at people that have come to faith in recent years and we say, you know, if only they had the experience I had, or if only they did the things that I did, or if only they valued the things that I valued, then they'd be okay. We try and bring maybe the glory days, maybe the things that we used to do and loved so well but don't do anymore. We try and make them instrumental to our faith. And we say, Jesus plus these things equal freedom. Well, Paul deconstructs that argument. He really does. He tells us that Jesus plus nothing equals freedom. Without any other moral code, without any history, without any other religious observances. The second thing that I think we do, the second way that we can apply this this morning, I think is really powerful. The other thing the Judaizers were trying to do was to bring their past into their freedom. And we get tempted to do that by the enemy. We get tempted to bring our pasts into our freedom. We get tempted to remember who we were and bring that into our freedom. You know, there's an ad on TV. You might have seen it. It's for Nescafe, Nescafe Gold, I think. There's a man, and he's standing in the middle of a, like an amphitheater. Have you seen the ad? And he's surrounded by like 80,000 people, and these are the people that he's connected with over his life. And he starts asking a series of questions. He says, sit down if you knew me back when. And a whole bunch of people sit down. He says, uh, sit down if you knew this about me. And people sit down. And then uh, eventually there's only a few people left. And he says to them, sit down if somehow we've lost touch. Think about the people that know you. Think about the people that knew you back then. Think about the people you hurt. Think about the things you did wrong. What would they say if they heard you now? What would they say if they saw you now? Would they believe a word that came out of your mouth? And how does that make you feel? Oh. See, Paul deconstructs this argument. Chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It'll come up on the screen. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Yeah, right. So I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So when the enemy comes to us, as he does, and he says, remember, remember what you did. Remember who you were. Remember how these people remember you. Paul says, well, you know that guy? You know that girl? Well, that person's dead. That person's gone. That person's been crucified with Christ. They don't live here anymore. And they didn't leave a forwarding address. That person is no longer here. So when Satan comes as the postman to bring you a parcel of guilt and shame, you say, that guy doesn't live here anymore. That woman doesn't live here anymore. And there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Hmm. So we don't try and work off our salvation by working off our past. Let me say that again. We don't try and work our salvation by working off our past. And I think the last application this morning is about control. Because you see, I think that quite often in our lives we try and create a moral code that we hold up next to Jesus. We hold a clipboard up here and we say, okay, if we act this way, I can give it a tick here. If I don't do this thing, I can give it a tick here. If I do this thing, I can give it a tick here. We have ourselves a score sheet. And I think we keep that score sheet close because we enjoy the control of knowing that we're doing well in our faith. But Paul turns that argument on his head as well. Chapter 3, 3 to 5, he says, How foolish can you be? He says, After starting on new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles in you because you obey the law? Of course not. Because you heard the message, believe the message you heard about Christ. 
wonder if we can just start playing the song. This morning, I'm going to give you a chance to spend a few moments reflecting. Reflecting on Jesus, but more specifically, reflecting on whatever it may be that we try and put next to Jesus. And I wonder if this morning you could humor me for a second. I wonder if this morning you wouldn't mind holding your hands up like this. Just do some fists. Just on your knees. Just wherever you are. There's no power in this. It's not a ritual. But it may be helpful for you. I want you to hold your hands up this morning. I invite you to consider the question. As we sing this song, I want you to consider the question. Are you comfortable with the thought that Jesus plus nothing is your freedom? Are you comfortable with that thought? Or is there something inside you? says, well, I'm still hanging on to this. I'm still being reminded of this. I'm still trying to keep the control of this. This morning as we sing, and as we reflect on these words, I'd invite you to be in prayer. And as you pray this morning, it may be helpful for you to simply open your hands, release anything else that may be in your life that you're holding on to as well as Christ. Release it to Him and claim your faith, you're justified by grace through faith in Christ alone. Will you do that this morning?